We're working on the uh, finding the standard angular momentum basis for wave functions uh, in three-dimensional space representing a particle without spin, a uh, single particle moving in three-dimensional space. Uh, the standard angular momentum basis is otherwise uh, the angular basis of uh, the operators L squared and LZ. Uh, and uh, so we took those operators and applied them to a wave function called psi LL. The strategy here is to first find the stretch state in which the magnetic quantum number is equal to L, its maximum value. So the LZ equation just says that LZ acts on psi LL and brings out the quantum number L. There's also an L squared equation. However, we replace that with a different one, uh, which involves the raising operator L plus. Uh, the logic is that uh, the stretch state is annihilated by the raising operator, and it actually gives us an equation to work with that's actually easier than the L squared equation, although it's actually equivalent. In any case, we solved these two equations for psi LL, the stretch wave function, and we found that it was an arbitrary function of the radius multiplied times sine L theta times e to the i L phi. In other words, the theta and phi dependence is determined, but not the radial dependence of the wave function. This makes sense because the angular momentum operators are reminded they don't involve any radial derivatives. In fact, they don't involve radial, radial coordinate at all. They're purely angular. And so they determine the angular dependence, but not the radial dependence. Now, what this means is that the uh, operators L squared and LZ, uh, taken by themselves, uh, do not form a complete set of commuting observables for a wave function in three dimensions. Uh, that's because this G of R here, since this is arbitrary, it means that the simultaneous eigenstates are degenerate. You can choose any radial wave function you want. Another way to say that is that if you want to have a unique specification of basis space, you need an additional index or else an additional observable to make a complete set. One way of doing that is just to take this radial wave function G of R and replace it by, you can just, just call it UN of R, where let's say UN of R is a, let's, let's just say it's a basis, an orthonormal basis of radial wave functions. If we do this, then we now have the wave function side, which has three indices on its side, N, L, L. And uh, the, uh, this gives us a state. We can write it in Dirac language this way as N, L, L, like this with three quantum numbers. Uh, then having got that, we can apply the lowering operator, L minus, uh, which will lower the magnetic quantum number. L minus, let's say, to the power L minus M applied to psi N, L, L will give us psi N, L, M. If you, uh, times are constant, there's, a, there's factorials and so on in here. But within a constant, it lowers it down to uh, an arbitrary magnetic quantum number, psi N, L, M. And this can direct a cat language we might write this way as N, L, M. <coughs> and uh, this way, we would have a, uh, a, a unique specification of basis states. This, this is an example of a standard angular momentum basis. Uh, the general notation that we developed earlier was gamma J, M where gamma just stood for any extra quantum numbers needed. In the present case, it's the radial quantum number, and the J is the same as L in this context. All right. Now, there's a slightly easier approach to this whole subject, which is just to ignore the radial variable altogether. Uh, and instead of talking about functions on three-dimensional space, let's talk about functions just as a function of the angle of theta and phi, like this. So I have two functions, g of theta and f and g of theta and phi. These uh, can be regarded as functions uh, on a sphere. Uh, the radius of the sphere doesn't matter. We can just take it to be a radius of 1 and talk about the unit sphere. Only the angular dependence matters. We can find a scalar product of such functions, f and g, as the integral over solid angle, the omega, times f of theta and phi complex conjugate and times g of theta and phi. So there's a Hilbert space of wave functions on the unit sphere like this. The d omega, of course, is the angular part of the uh, normalization integral that you've used for the wave functions in three-dimensional space. It's also a radial part, but this is the angular part. Um, and if we do this, then, uh, then uh, uh, we can now ask for what is the standard angular momentum basis for functions on the unit sphere? That's to say, the simultaneous eigenstates of L squared and LZ. Well, the equations are going to be the same as we have here, except it's going to be, let's call it FLL, so the stretch state is a function of theta and phi. Uh, it will first of all be annihilated by L plus, and secondly, if we apply LZ to it, uh, we're going to get uh, a factor of L coming out, FLL theta and phi. And it's really practically the same problem as we just dealt with, except there's no radial coordinate. So we know what the solution is. It is at FLL of theta and phi, and I'll leave the space for a normalization constant here. 
is assigned uh, all theta times e to the i alpha phi. Same calculation as, as uh, on Monday, like that. Now, if we normalize this, integrating over all solid angles to get the norm, uh, it's an integral to do. And if you do, you find the answer is this. It's 1 over 2 to the L times L factorial. And then there's the square root of 2L plus 1 factorial divided by 4 pi. Just do the integral and you get that. Uh, so this is the normalized stretch state. Um, and then finally, uh, if I introduce a conventional phase factor, which is minus 1 to the L, which I can't explain, it's just a convention, uh, then instead of calling it F, it would be better if we called it Y, because this is actually the stretched YLM, the stretched state for the YLMs. In other words, the simultaneous eigenstates of L squared and LZ on the unit sphere of the YLM, so the uh, square of harmonics. Now, um, once we have those, so we can also think of these in Ket language this way, it's just write it LL. You notice on the unit sphere there's no degeneracy. Um, there's a normalization in phase, but specifying uh, L squared and LZ, their quantum numbers, gives a unique wave function. Um, all right. So, um, by the way, another thing to mention here is that the L, the angular momentum quantum number, only takes on integer values. There are no half integer values that appear. That's because in solving the LZ equation, here, the LZ is a DD phi, somewhere here. If I summarize the operators, the LZ is minus I DD phi. Um, we're solving the LZ equation, which gives us the E to the L, A to the I L phi dependence. If you want the answer to be single value, L has to be an integer. Although I mentioned in uh, last lecture that we could see that there were only integer values would appear anyway, uh, way back at the level of the rotation operators, because those were single value representations of the classical rotations, not double value as you would have with half integer angular momenta. So the spherical harmonics, uh, the spherical harmonics uh, do not have any uh, half integer angular momentum. This is the stretch spherical harmonic here. Now, if you want the other spherical harmonics, uh, the YLMs of beta and phi, these will be obtained just by applying lowering operators. This will be some constant, and we'll apply the L minus to the L minus M power applied to the YLL of beta and phi. And this will give us all the rest of the spherical harmonics going from m equals plus l down to m equals minus l, which there's 2l plus 1. The l minus operator uh, is a summarized here. It's a differential operator like this. We need to raise it to some power and let it act on this expression here for the stretch state. Now, if you do that uh, and you go through the algebra, what you'll find is that this, this, uh, this operator raised to this power, uh, by, by playing games with it, you can convert it into an expression involving the uh, Rodriguez formula for the associated Legendre functions. And when the smoke clears, what you end up with is a, a few basic facts about the YLMs, which I'll summarize here. Is that first of all, YLM of theta and phi turns out to be a constant times the associated Legendre function to indicate the PLM of cosine theta times e to the i m phi. Now, the details of this are presented in the notes, including all the constants the constants that come out, so I won't go through through that. But this is the, uh, one of the main results. Um, the associated Legendre functions are normally thought of as only being defined for positive m, whereas the m here can take on negative values. And so uh, it would be uh, one way of writing this is to put an absolute value around that m, and this, this formula then also applies for negative values of m as well. Uh, it's worthwhile remembering that the yln goes either the i and phi, the dependence on the azimuthal angle is particularly simple. Another thing that might be worthwhile remembering is, is that the associate Legendre function goes like the sine to the absolute value of m power theta times a polynomial. Uh, polynomial uh, in uh, cosine theta. That's why I'm calling them functions because they aren't really polynomials in cosine theta. The sine goes like, of course, one, one uh, square root of one minus cosine squared theta. In any case, what this shows is that these are equal to zero at the north pole, uh, uh, where uh, theta is equal to zero. That's the north pole, uh, unless m equals zero. 
the special case of m equals zero is uh, given a separate name. It's, it's, it, but it's, given, it's indicated this way. It's PL without any M index on it. And this is the, these are the ordinary Legendre polynomials. In this, case, in this case, they genuinely are polynomials. And the e to the i of phi becomes just one, so it disappears. So for the special case of magnetic quantum number zero, the YLM is proportional to the Legendre polynomials. All right, I think those are the basic facts about the YLMs. Most of, most of the facts will be important for us. The rest of them you can look it up in the tables. Actually, the truth is, is that generally in quantum mechanics, it's uh, easier to work with the raising and lowering operators than it is to work with the wave functions. This is certainly true for the harmonic oscillator, but it's also true for YLMs if you can do this. All right. Now, um, the YLMs are uh, obviously give a, a privileged role to the Z direction. Uh, that's partly because the spherical coordinate system does. One of the angles, the yes, neutral angle, is about the z-axis, and there's no analogous angles around the x and the y-axis. Uh, for this reason, uh, in, uh, in physics problems, we oftentimes make the directions of beams and magnetic fields and things like that along the z-direction. However, there are lots of problems where things are not pointed along the z-direction, or maybe you have two beams and they can't both be in the z-direction. And for that reason, it's, uh, it's oftentimes, in practical problems, it's oftentimes necessary to rotate YLMs and, in fact, to uh, refer them to a different axis than the z-axis. And so for that reason, as well as some others, I want to tell you now about rotating YLMs. Uh, so uh, before I do that, however, let me introduce us some, uh, uh, some slightly new notation. Let's uh, draw the axes x, y, and z like this, and let me put in uh, an octant of the sphere. And let's draw a unit vector, which I'll call r hat, which just indicates some point on the, on the, on the sphere here, unit, unit sphere. That point, of course, can be specified by its, uh, let me draw it better. That point, of course, can be specified by its uh, spherical angles. Uh, so here's the angle theta, and then here's the angle, and then like this, here's the angle phi. And if you'll allow me, I will write r hat as just an alternative notation for the spherical angle state in phi, just to indicate a point on the, on the uh, unit sphere. And so, for example, at some function of theta in phi, I'll also write this as f of r hat in an equivalent notation. That's supposed to be an r hat. Uh, we can also write this in a Dirac notation, uh, if you like, like this, just as we do with ordinary wave functions where the ket f represents the function f of theta and phi, and the ket r hat, which has been turned into a bra there in the matrix element, represents a delta function which is concentrated on the sphere at a particular theta phi location. So that when you do the integral of the scalar product, it just picks out the value of a given point. Anyway, it's a direct notation for, for functions on the unit sphere. <coughs> now let's take a while, well, let's take a rotation, let's make it a proper rotation. And let's take a YLM and let's say evaluate it at a point R hat on the sphere. Or rather, let's do it this way. Let's take a YLM and let's rotate it. And then we'll evaluate the rotated YLM at a point R hat on the sphere. Now, what I'm going to do is to uh, evaluate this rotated YLM in two different ways, which gives rise to an interesting result. The first way is to use the definition of what rotation operators do on wave functions in three dimensions. You know, you rotate the argument by the inverse classical rotation. So this is YLM of capital R inverse applied to R hat. All right, that's one way of expressing this. Another way of expressing this is to say that this is the wave function evaluated at, at position R hat in the sphere of the rotated state. So if I think of YLM, of r hat in the Dirac language this way is r hat lm, where the ket lm just stands for the same as the ylm. Then on the left hand side here, we have the wave function of the rotated state. That in Dirac language is r hat on the left, the rotation operator in the middle, and then the ylm on the right hand side. It means the same thing. Now, allow me to insert a resolution of the identity between the uh, draw r hat and, and the unitary rotation operator. So this becomes then the sum on m prime of r hat l m prime l m prime u of r and l m. Like <coughs> Here I want to pause because you can clearly see the outer product, which is a part of the resolution of the identity. 
Uh, but notice that I'm only summing on M prime. To get a resolution of the identity, you need to sum over a complete set. On the sphere, the complete set is all the YLMs, including varying L as well as M. Uh, there's no extra quantum numbers needed because, as we showed just a moment ago, there's L squared and LZ to be a unique state if you're on the unit sphere. But the question here is, why didn't I sum also over L in order to get a complete, resol a complete set of, uh, of uh, basis states in this resolution of the identity? Well, the answer is I could have. I could have put this in L prime and made this like this, in which case we really do have a, an insertion of the resolution of the identity. However, the matrix elements of the rotation operator are diagonal in the angular momentum. So this matrix element here goes like uh, delta LL prime. And if I take that fact into account, I can do the L prime sum, and it just replaces L prime by L and takes me back to where I was a minute ago. So that's part of the explanation. But let me just uh, remark about this a little more. Uh, the, fact that, the fact that this matrix element of the rotation operator is diagonal in L and L prime is sometimes expressed, this is common language in quantum mechanics, it's expressed by saying the rotation operator does not mix, is the expression, does not mix states of different L. That's just another way of saying it's diagonal in L. There's another way of saying it, however, which is to say that the states which appear on the right-hand side here, these are the standard angular momentum basis, or the YLMs. If you fix the value of L and allow M to be variable, that's to say you consider the span of, of states LM like this for a fixed L, but where M ranges from minus L all the way up to plus L. This is a space that we've been calling an irreducible uh, subspace, more exactly or more precisely an, an irreducible invariant subspace. To say that it's invariant means that the rotation operator acts on a vector of the space, it produces another vector in the same space. In particular, if it acts on an LM, it produces a linear combination of these same vectors with that same value of L, but not other values of L. And this is just another way of saying that the matrix elements are diagonal in L and L prime. Anyway, I just want to point out all those different ways of interpreting this. But when all is said and done, I can remove the L prime from the sum and take the primes off the L here. And then what we've got is, is uh, this, but it, it's really just a resolution of the identity being inserted in here. Now, having done that, um, the first term, we can do some things with this. The first term is uh, the y l m prime evaluated at position r hat on the sphere. And the second term is a D matrix. This is the definition of the D matrix. It's the matrix elements of rotation operators between uh, angular momentum basis states. So this is a D matrix with index L, M prime M, and it's parameterized by the classical rotation R like this. And so the result is just to just to repeat this, is we have one version of a ro rotation operator here, one, one result, one rotating the Y in one way, and here's rotating it in another way. Let me uh, uh, clean it up and write out the formula here. So YLM at the inverse rotated position is equal to a sum of M prime of YL M prime at the original position multiplied times the D matrix DL M prime M of the rotation matrix R like this. So this is the basic formula for rotating YLMs. As you see, the rotated YLM is expressed as a linear combination of the unrotated ones. Now this formula gives us the value of the YLM at a rotated point on the sphere in terms of the YLMs at some other point. If this other point, if we take that to be a reference point, then you see if you know the value of one point in the sphere, you can use this formula to get the YLMs anywhere on the sphere in terms of the D matrices. A convenient reference point is the North Pole. If I make this, allow me, allow me just to use my eraser and replace R hat by the North Pole here, like this, Z hat like this. If we do this, then we're now expressing a YLM at an arbitrary point in terms of the value of the North Pole. Well, what is the value of the North Pole? Uh, as I explained a moment ago, it may still be up there, is that in the North Pole, all the YLMs are equal to zero unless M is equal to zero. And so this is proportional to, to delta M prime zero. And it turns out when you go through the normalization constants and so on, the proportionality factor is the square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi. And so this sum can be done, and this becomes the M prime goes to zero, so what we get is the square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi 
times the D matrix VL uh, uh, M prime is zero, zero M evaluated at uh, rotation matrix R like this. Now, uh, allow me to, uh, allow, let's, let's think of this R inverse Z hat here as some uh, position on the sphere at which we wish to evaluate the YLMs. It actually might be easier to understand this if I replace R by its inverse. So let me copy the formula down again on the left hand side here, R inverse Z hat. And now if it will allow me again to use my eraser, I'll replace R by R inverse. R is a dummy variable here, so I can replace it by its inverse. So the inverse goes away there and it pops up over here, like that. Now let's think of R z hat as a point on the sphere. In particular, let's let R in Euler angle form have Euler angles phi, theta, and zero. These are otherwise what we call the Euler angles alpha, beta, gamma. So this is a rotation about the z axis by angle phi, multiplied times a rotation about the y axis by angle theta. The reason I do that is because if we apply this rotation, draw a picture you can see, here's the XYZ, if I draw a better picture. If we start with a vector on the Z axis, the unit vector, and we first rotate by Y about the Y axis by an angle theta, you see it swings it out by angle theta in the XZ plane. Then we follow it by a rotation about the Z axis by an angle phi, and swings it out like this. And what it does is it produces it produces a unit vector pointing in the direction theta and, theta and phi. In other words, we have this, is that this particular rotation, phi, theta, zero, applied to the z-axis, is equal to a vector r hat, which has coordinates theta and phi in the sphere. And so, if we interpret the rotation in a YLM formula as this particular one in Euler angle form, then on the left-hand side, we've got a position theta and phi. On the right hand side, we've got a D matrix which can be expressed in Euler angle form. Uh, actually, allow me to take this R inverse and use the unitarity of the D matrices. The inverse of a unitary matrix is its Hermitian conjugate. So I can take this minus one out and replace it by a dagger. That's to say it's the D matrix, it's the D matrix dagger of this component. But the dagger is the same thing as the transpose complex conjugate. So it's the same thing as taking the M in zero and replacing it by zero M and putting a star here like this. And now finally, if I plug in this particular Euler angle rotation into this formula, then here's what we get. This is a little bit of the theory of the YLMs connecting with rotations. Here's what we get is this. Is we get YLM of theta and phi is the square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi times the D matrix DL uh, M0 of phi, theta, and 0. Those are the Euler angles complex conjugated. Uh, so this reveals a relationship. It reveals that the YLMs can be expressed in terms of the D matrices. There are special cases of D matrices in which one index is 0 and one of the Euler angles is 0. Uh, in fact, if you really want to develop the theory of the YLMs, it's best to do it in terms of the D matrices. It's the most elegant way of doing it. Now, uh, this is one result about YLMs that I want to mention. There's another one I want to mention, which is the addition theorem for the spherical harmonics. This is discussed in Jackson's book, but without the use of rotation operators. Let me show you what the uh, reason for it is. Is that uh, in dealing with uh, problems in, a, in uh, atomic physics or in Unet's matter physics, one oftentimes has to deal with this expression where R and R prime are two vectors. The idea is that these are two vectors indicating the positions of two charged particles. And so the Coulomb potential between them is proportional to this difference. This is also, of course, the Green's function for the Poisson equation. And it's oftentimes necessary to expand this in terms of the angular dependence of the two vectors. Let's let R vector and spherical coordinates be R theta and phi. And let's let r prime vector and spherical coordinates be r prime theta prime phi prime. The expansion works like this. It involves solving the Laplace equation. What we do is we define, let's call it r less than as the minimum of r and r prime. And r greater than is the maximum of r and r prime. 
And if you do this, you can show that this this uh, Coulomb and this Coulomb denominator here can be written as a sum from L equals zero to infinity of angular momentum quantum numbers times the expression R less than the L divided by R greater than the L plus one multiplied by the Legendre polynomial of an angle I'll call gamma, cosine gamma, where gamma is the angle between the vectors <coughs> and R prime. So imagine this, you've got a coordinate system x, y, and z. You've got two vectors here, one might be short and another one long, r and r prime. They represent the positions of two charged particles, and you've got a distance between them, which is in the denominator here. And then the gamma, then, is the angle between these two vectors, like this. All right. Now, um, it's oftentimes necessary to express this to expand the angular dependence in theta and phi as well as theta th prime and phi prime in terms of y lms. Just by looking at the picture, you might imagine you could use rotation operators to rotate one or the other of these two vectors onto the z-axis, and then the angle gamma would become the theta coordinate of the other vector, and then somehow use rotations, uh, rotation operators to bring it back into its original shape. And that's in fact true, and if you do this, what you find is the following, that you find that, uh, that this is equal to 4 pi divided by 2L plus 1 times the sum of magnetic quantum numbers of the YLM of one of the uh, positions on the sphere of theta and phi times the YLM complex conjugate of the other one, theta prime and phi prime, like this. Oh, excuse me. Here's what I mean to say. Is that this is the same thing as the Legendre polynomial of the dot product of the unit vectors. <coughs> this is the expansion I want. It's the expansion of the Legendre polynomial part of this earlier sum. So the r dot r hat dotted and r hat prime, this is the same thing I was calling cosine gamma. It's the angle between the two radial vectors. And here it is fully expanded in terms of spherical harmonics. I won't go through the derivation of this. This is in the notes, uh, and you can uh, read it there. But it's an important result. We'll use it later in dealing with uh, perturbation theory in atomic physics. Uh, you may also want to compare the derivation in my notes, which uses rotation operators, to the one in Jackson's book, which is hindered by the fact that he, 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 does, he can't use rotation operators in that book, because it's a, it's a different, uh, different course. OK, so those are the basic facts about the YLMs. Now what I'd like to do is to turn to central force motion, which occupies for uh, several lectures. To begin with, let's suppose we've got some object that creates a central force field. I'll draw this big, big dot there. And let's suppose there's a simplification that its mass goes to infinity, so it's, it's a very massive uh, object. And this allows us to attach a frame to it, x, y, and z, which is an, an inertial frame. Uh, and then let's suppose there's another uh, a particle out here of mass m, which is, which is finite, and it's moving in the force field. And let's suppose the force field is described by a potential, which is a function only of the radius uh, of the, the distance between the two particles, like this. Uh, under these circumstances, the motion of this uh, particle's lowercase m uh, is it becomes effectively a one-body problem. It's just moving in a fixed uh, force field created by the other, other physical object of the origin. It does rely on the approximation or the assumption that the mass is, is, in, is infinite of the object that's creating the force. Uh, in many circumstances, this is a pretty good approximation. For example, in atoms, the nucleus is several thousand times heavier than all the electrons combined. In the solar system, the sun is like a thousand times as massive as Jupiter, which is the most massive planet. So there's a lot of cases where this holds true. In any case, uh, we did end up with, a, uh, with, with a effectively a one-body problem. A Hamiltonian for this is the sum of the kinetic and the potential energies. The kinetic energy is p squared over 2m, and the potential is v of r. The kinetic energy, by the way, is the square of the momentum three vector. So if I want to emphasize that, I'll write it this way. It's a square of the vector. Um, now, uh, about this Hamiltonian, the first thing to say is that it commutes with rotations. If I take a, ro a classical rotation R and then the corresponding rotation operator, exactly as we've been uh, talking about this week, you'll find that it commutes with a Hamiltonian. 
uh, uh, it's easy to see why this is so. It's because this Hamiltonian is invariant under rotations. The kinetic energy is involves a dot product of the momentum with itself, and dot products are invariant under rotations. And the potential energy is a function of the distance only, which is obviously invariant under rotations about the origin. And this means that H commutes with uh, all rotation operators. Now, in particular, it will commute with infinitesimal rotation operators that have the form of 1 minus i over h bar, an angle theta times n hat dotted into L. This is for the case when the angle is small. And if we plug that in there, it follows from this that h, h commutes with all three components of the angular momentum. Now, you can uh, directly use the definition of orbital angular momentum as r cross p and use this Hamiltonian and work out the commutator. You may have done a calculation like this already in your undergraduate course, and you'll find they're equal to zero. But what I want to point out here is the geometrical meaning of the vanishing of those commutators is that the Hamiltonian is rotationally invariant. And if you're in a hurry and you want to see if something commutes with the components of angular momentum, the way to do it is just look at it and see if it's rotationally invariant. Is it made up out of dot products? The answer will always be that this would be one of these vanishing commutators. Notice that if H commutes with all three components of angular momentum, then it commutes with any function of those three components of angular momentum, which include the rotation operators. So the implication works the other way as well. All right. So since H commutes with all three components of L, we start to think about forming a complete set of commuting observables. However, the components of L don't commute with each other. So one strategy is to do this is to consider the set that consists of H and L squared and LC because L squared and LC are a convenient pair of operators constructed out of angular momentum which do commute with each other. And in fact, we already know what their eigenstates look like. The eigenstates look like this. Uh, let's call it psi LM uh, of R theta and phi. We know that it's equal to an arbitrary radial wave function which I'll now call capital R of R multiplied times Y LM of theta and phi. So as far as finding the eigenstates of L squared and LC, we've done that part already. I'm sorry, don't confuse capital R for the radial wave function with capital R for the rotation matrix. I think from context it will be clear which one is intended. In any case, the idea here is, is that when we, in addition, require that the wave function be an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, that will determine the radial wave function and will have overall a unique, uh, a unique uh, uh, wave function to within normalization and phase. In other words, H L squared and L Z will form a complete set of commuting observables. So to see how we determine the radial wave function, all we need to do is to take this form for the overall wave function and plug it into the Schrodinger equation, which is going to be H psi equals E psi. Let's consider the time independent uh, Schrodinger equation. And there's two terms in the Hamiltonian. There's the kinetic and potential energies. The uh, kinetic energy P squared will turn into a Laplacian operator, of course, when you, uh, when you write it out as a differential operator. And the Laplacian operator can be converted into spherical coordinates. And um, this is a standard thing to do. It involves actually quite a lot of algebra if you do it in a brute force way. But I summarized the results for us in the form that we needed here. Here's the momentum uh, operator squared. It's minus h bar squared times the Laplacian. And that in turn involves minus h bar squared times the radial part of the Laplacian, which is here. And it turns out the angular part of the Laplacian is L squared over R squared, where L squared is the square of the angular momentum. Here it is worked out. There's obviously a fair amount of algebra in, in, in deriving these results, but they're standard results that you can find in any in back flat, flat of your typical book on the NM. Uh, but in any case, the angular part is proportional to L squared. Now, L squared and R, R squared here are both operators acting on wave functions, and I've written in this funny way of L squared divided by R squared. Operators in general don't commute. But remember, L squared only involves angular derivatives. So it commutes with 1 over R squared, and it doesn't matter which of these two factors I put first. So this is actually a meaningful expression, even though those are really operators. All right. So the idea, then, is to use this <coughs> divided by 2M and convert it into kinetic energy in the been covered up now, in the kinetic energy part of the Hamiltonian, and then include this term, the L squared over R squared. And uh, we will then get the, uh, get the explicit expression of H acting on size. So let's do this. 
So first of all, we have H minus h bar squared over 2, and there's the radial particle Poisson, which is, d, is 1 over r squared uh, ddr times r squared times ddr. And this acts on psi, which I'll write as capital R of r times yln of theta phi. And then there is the second term of the Laplacian, which is L squared over R squared. I have to divide that by 1 over 2m. So I get plus 1 over 2m R squared times L squared acting on R of R yln of theta and phi. Then I have the potential energy plus V of R. I'm going to space here if I'm not careful. Capital R of R times, times yln of theta and phi. And on the right hand side, we have the total energy times r of r times y l and theta and phi. Just plugging this, this eigenfunction of L squared and LZ into the uh, eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian. Now, the only place an angular derivative has occurred here is in the L squared operator. And in fact, L squared, as I keep saying, involves only angular derivatives. So, in particular, it just shines right through this r of r and it acts only in the YLM. And when it does, it brings out the eigenvalue, which is L times L plus 1 h bar squared. And having done that, the operator disappears and is now replaced by this constant. And so now all four terms, 1, 2, 3, 4, involve the same YLM factor, which we can cancel out. And we end up with an equation for the radial wave function alone. And it becomes this minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over r squared ddr times r squared times d capital R dr plus uh, l times l plus 1 h bar squared over 2m r squared times capital R of r plus v of r times capital R of r is equal to the energy times capital R of r. In fact, it's customary in this business to define what I call u of r is equal to the potential v of r plus uh, l times l plus 1 h bar squared over 2m r squared. Uh, this is just a definition of u of r, u of r, but what we say is, is that uh, v is the true potential. The l, this l times l plus 1 h bar squared over 2m r squared is a centrifugal potential. And the U of R is said to be the effective potential. Notice that physically the centrifugal potential is actually part of the kinetic energy. In fact, the truth is that it's the angular part of the kinetic energy, whereas the first term here involving the radial derivatives is the radial part of the kinetic energy. The classical picture of this is, is that if we've got, here's the radius vector R from the origin, and you've got a particle which is moving at some velocity like this. Let's say here's a velocity vector like this. You break the velocity into a radial part into an angular part. And the radial part of the velocity gives you a radial kinetic energy, and the angular part gives you an angular kinetic energy. And that's what these two terms are. Nevertheless, from a mathematical standpoint, the centrifugal potential is a function only of the radius, at least for fixed value of L. And so it looks like a potential. And so people usually throw it in with the true potential to create the effective potential. It's the standard of the do. In any case, to repeat then, we could write the radial Schrodinger equation like this. Minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over r squared dbr, r squared d of the radial wave function with respect to r plus u of r times the radial wave function is equal to the energy times the radial wave function. This radial wave function is normalized by using an integral 0 to infinity of r squared dr times r of r squared. This is the normalization integral. The reason we put an r squared in here is because this is really uh, the radial part of the normalization integral of the wave function in three-dimensional space that this thing came from. As far as the angular integration, we took care of that already with the YLMs where we put in a d omega. All right. 
Uh, let's call this version one of the radial Schrodinger equation. There's another version which is obtained by making a definition, we call it f of r is equal to the radius times capital R of r. So if you plug that in and do the algebra, then what you get is, for the function f, is you get minus h bar squared over 2m, b squared f dr squared, plus u of r times f of r, is the energy times f of r. And let's call this version two of the radial Schrodinger equation. Version two is easy to remember because it looks just like the Schrodinger equation for a particle moving in one dimension, except we call the variable r here instead of x. And remember that r only goes from zero to infinity. And the u of r is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, is the effective potential, which includes the centrifugal potential. But it has the same mathematical form as the one dimensional Schrodinger equation. And many of the results that uh, we know about one dimensional Schrodinger equations can be applied here as well. So for example, if the wave function vanishes at infinity, if you're talking about a bound state, it will. It means that it's non-degenerate. Uh, so uh, anyway, these are these two different versions. And different versions are useful in different, different uh, circumstances. Uh, by this substitution, f of r equals r times capital R, you can see that the normalization integral in the second version of the Schrodinger equation is simply integral from zero to infinity dr of the absolute value of f of r squared. The normalization integral also looks like what we did in one dimensional quantum mechanics, except that the limits of integration are only zero to infinity. All right. Now, one thing to notice about the radial Schrodinger equation is that since the effective potential up here depends on the angular momentum quantum number, it means that the wave functions and the energies will also depend on the angular momentum quantum number. And if we want to make that explicit, let me put an L on both the energy and the radial wave functions. This is going to be true uh, in, either, in either of these two versions. It's going to be true, um, it's always going to be true that, that the energies and, and wave functions depend on L. Now, in addition to that, if there are, uh, well, one thing to say is, is that the, uh, the energy in question can either be a, a continuous or discrete. You can either have bound states or you can have a continuous spectrum. It depends on the circumstances. But if you're talking about bound states, then of course there will be discrete energies, the energy eigenvalues. And so you need an extra index to, in to index those. So if you call, uh, so in other words, you need to introduce a, another quantum number. Let's call it n. It's kind of a radial quantum number. Uh, and in general, for the bound states, which have discrete index, this energy, as well as radial wave functions, really we need to put a second index on there. We call it NL. Run through here and write it like this. So the E and Ls, then, are the energy eigenvalues of the radial wave equation, which is indexed by L. It kind of works like this. If we take the case L equals zero, and I draw an energy axis going like this, we talk L equals zero down here, and I draw the energy eigenvalues, they can be something like this. They're going to be, the, the, the points won't lie on top of each other because there'll be, there is no degeneracy because the wave function dies off at infinity. But you might get some spectrum like this. And for L equals 1, you get a, you're going to get another spectrum. And the basic idea is that these different spectra for different values of L normally don't talk to each other. That's to say, one of these wave equations doesn't know about the others. And so it isn't very likely that any of these energy eigenvalues for one of the one of the L's will coincide with the energy eigenvalues for any other L. This is a normal situation in some randomly chosen central force potential. Notice, however, that the energies do not depend on the magnetic quantum number. You see, the total weight function in three-dimensional space is psi is psi n L m uh, of r theta and phi, which will be the radial weight function. R N L of the radius R times the Y L M of theta and phi. But the energies depend only on N and L. The energies of the radial wave functions depend only on N and L, but the full wave function in three-dimensional space also depends on the magnetic quantum number. And the result of this is that if you take into account the magnetic quantum number, is that each of these E N Ls, which is each of these spots that I drew here, has a degeneracy, which is 2L plus 1, because of the possible magnetic quantum numbers. This is a generic degeneracy, which occurs in all central force problems in three dimensions. Physically, the reason why the energy does not depend on the magnetic quantum number 
is that that is the quantum number that indicates the orientation of the system. It's the uh, projection of the uh, angular momentum vector on the z-axis, and that's something that depends on the orientation. But the energy itself does not depend on the orientation because the system is rotationally invariant. And that's the physical reason for this degeneracy. All right. Now, here's another uh, basic fact about, uh, about radial, radial wave equations. This has to do with the behavior of the radial wave function near the origin. In many problems, uh, you need to know uh, how the wave function behaves near the origin. Uh, so we're interested in what happens as r goes to zero of the radial wave function of rl with r. I'll leave off the independence here because it won't matter, but there's some angular momentum quantum number l. For example, in atoms, the size of the nucleus is something like 10 to the fifth times smaller than the size of the atom. Uh, many problems require knowing the electron wave function in the neighborhood of the nucleus, perturbation theory and various other things. Uh, and so, in comparison to the scale length of the wave function, which is determined by the size of the atom, you're really looking at a very tiny part of the wave function way down near r equals zero. That's a typical problem when one needs to know this. Uh, let's suppose that the radial wave function at small r goes as a power law. Let's say it goes as r to some power k plus high order terms, which we'll ignore here. And the problem is to find out what is the power k. So to answer that question, we just simply substitute this into the radial Schrodinger equation, which is up there at the top of the board. If r goes as, as a r to a r to the k, then r prime, its first derivative, goes as a times k times r to the k minus 1. If I then multiply by r squared, I'm following the formula up there for the radial part of the uh, kinetic energy up above. Multiply r squared, then I get k minus 1 goes to k plus 1. If I take r squared r prime and take this derivative again, that goes as a times k times k plus 1 times r to the k. And then if I then divide this by 1 over r squared, then I get r to the k minus 2 here. And if I divide by minus, multiply by minus h bar squared over 2m to complete the, I have room here for this, minus h bar squared over 2m, put that in here. This then is the leading behavior of the first term of the radial Schrodinger equation when r is 0, it looks like that. Now, moving on to the second term, we've got the u of r. The u of r has the centrifugal potential and the, and the true potential. And as far as the centrifugal potential goes, that's L times L plus 1 h bar squared over 2 m r squared times capital R of r. And if capital R of r goes like a times r to the k, this thing just becomes L times L plus 1 h bar squared over 2 m r 2 m. And then we have an a times r to the k minus 2 minus 2 constant dividing by the r squared here. What about the true potential v of r times the radial wave function r of r? How does that go? Well, the answer is it depends on what the true potential is. In particular, it depends on how singular the true potential is at the origin. In practice, the most singular true potential we ever deal with, almost ever, is the Coulomb potential, which goes like 1 over r. And so, if if the radial wave function goes like r to the k, the worst that this potential can ever, this, this term can ever go as is, is, is r to the k minus 1. Let's just say that's the worst case that we'll ever encounter. But you see, this doesn't diverge as rapidly as r to the k minus 2, or r to the k minus 1 is much smaller than r to the k minus 2. So the true potential is actually negligible compared to the centrifugal potential. Likewise, if I multiply the energy times r of r, which is the right-hand side over there, this is going to go like r to the k. And so the dominant terms at small r come strictly from the kinetic energy, the radial part as well as the angular part. These two things have to balance each other. And the true potential and the total energy don't matter. Now, equating these two, setting the sum of these two equal to zero, you can see that the a and the h bar squared of the two m's cancel, and so does the r to the k minus 2. And what we're left with this is a k times k plus 1 is equal to l times l plus 1. Simple equation. Remember here, we're talking about a fixed value of l because we're thinking of a particular value of l for the radial Schrodinger equation. And k here is the unknown. 
that tells us how the wave function behaves near the origin. This equation is a quadratic equation in K, and it has two roots. One of them is K equals L, and the other one is K equals minus L minus 1. So given that L can go 0, 1, 2, 3, this means K is, in the first instance, is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And in the second one, it's minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on down the line like this. These negative powers of K would imply a radial wave function which diverges at the origin. And for minus 2, minus 3, etc., on down the line, those are non-physical because it piles up an infinite amount of probability around the origin, and the wave function is not normalizable. Also, the case minus 1 has to be excluded as well, because if the wave function psi goes as 1 over r, then the Laplacian, which appears in the kinetic energy, is going to go like a delta function of r. And that, of course, is singular at the origin. And the only way you could have this is if it were balanced by potential energy, which was also a delta function. Since we're limiting ourselves in the worst case to cool <coughs> potentials is most singular, that minus 1 has to be excluded also. Anyway, the result of this is that only k equals l uh, survives. And the main conclusion, simple conclusion is that the radial wave function r l of r near the origin goes as r to the l. It's, easy, it's an easy rule to remember. If I plot it, it looks like this. If I take r of r as a function of the radius r, then for l equals 0, you start with a constant value. So you can have a function that can do like this, but it has a generally non-zero value at the origin. This is l equals 0. If you take l equals 1, it's going to go linearly in r and look like this, l equals 1. If you take l equals 2, it's going to be a parabola. It'll do this, l equals 2. For l equals 3, it'll be a cubic polynomial. It lays down like this. And the result is, is that the wave function lies down ever more and more flatly as, as the angular momentum quantum number increases. If you think about a very tiny region around the origin here, like the size of the nucleus, you can see that the, it's only the L equals zero wave function is going to have any, any appreciable value down there, and all the rest of them won't count. Yes? So a question. So uh, when you try, if you try to integrate uh, to find the probability, and if I assume a 1 over r to the power, some power dependence of r uh, of the radial function, wouldn't part of that get cancelled by the r squared in the in the volume, uh, differential volume that I would be using to integrate? Yes, because in that case the vol in that case the probability is normalizable, but the problem is a different problem, which is that now the kinetic energy term in the Schrodinger equation gives you a delta function, and that would have to be balanced by either the potential energy or the true energy term, which won't happen because the radial wave function itself goes like 1 over r, and if we assume that the potential energy is no more singular than a Coulomb potential, there's no way to get a delta function in there. So that, that case is excluded for a different reason. But after, after all these are different arguments, the result is just a simple one, is that k equals l is the only solution. Yeah. So just to conclude, so, so because uh, the energies are also observables, and so is the probability, that is why we need to make sure that the energy is not, does not diverge. I mean, in other words, if you suppose there, if there was a quantity it was diverging, but it was not an observable. Well, you wouldn't have an energy unless you get an eigenfunction. The eigenfunction has, you know, has to satisfy, has to be normalizable to be a, a, a legitimate eigenfunction. So I don't know that you could even talk about the energy eigenvalue if you couldn't normalize the wave function. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's all.